Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. Today we're going to look at one of the longest sentences in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 14 is all just one sentence in New Testament Greek, but this is a great sentence. It's filled with mystery, mystery of the predestination, mystery of the Trinity, mystery of the end times. So. And in fact, all three persons of the Trinity show up in this one sentence. The first part is the blessings from the Father. Second part, blessings from the Son. Third part of that long sentence, blessings from the Holy Spirit. So let's get into this. And, and I want you to uh, take out your Bible, if you would, Ephesians chapter 1. But you know, I was eating lunch at McDonald's a few days ago. And I'm hearing over at another table a Jehovah's Witness and a Christian go at it on the Trinity. And the Jehovah's Witness says, you know, Constantine, the emperor, forced the Trinity on the church in 325 A.D. I'm going, oh, come on, please. And, and I couldn't help but jump into the conversation. The Trinity was around long before 325 A.D. Jesus' last words on earth were, baptize in the name of the singular, baptize them in the name singular of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the Trinity, even though the word isn't in the Bible, the concept is all over the Bible. But... We're going to get into these things now as we look at this long, important sentence. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 3. Let's pray first. Father, as we dig into this wonderful, mysterious verse, we would pray you would speak to us about predestination, about the Trinity, and about where this world will end. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to be our teacher this, this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 3. The Apostle Paul writes to the Christians at Ephesus in uh, modern-day Turkey. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stop there. First lesson I want you to get. It says, blessed be the God and Father who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. The first lesson is, we bless God because he first blessed us. Do you know that every one of Paul's letters in the Bible, except for Titus, every one of Paul's letters begins with him praising God. And so, you know, I, I, maybe we should do that. Next time you write an email or send somebody a letter, dear so-and-so, yeah, you know what God did for me today? I, you know, just, but, but Paul was always praising God in his letters. And, you know, this convicts me. We need to not whine so much. We need to praise God and whine a lot less. I mean, I was convicted about this. I, I, I've lived in Minnesota now most of my life. Now, I don't mean to be critical, but I don't like Minnesota. It's cold. It's so politically liberal in the state of Minnesota. But I had an old white hair pastor say, Tom, when you complain about the weather, you're complaining about the Lord. <laughs> so the first lesson I want you to get is let's whine a lot less and praise God a lot more. Let look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father. He blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Here's the next lesson. In Christ, we are already in heaven. That's what it says. Now, now follow this. Adam used to be our head, our representative, the father of the human race. He got us all damned. Jesus now is the new head, the new representative for the human race. And it says we are in Christ. So if this is you and me, and this is Christ, we're in Christ. Where is Jesus right now? He's in heaven. So if you are in Christ, you are already in heaven right now. In Christ. <laughs> in fact, here, here's the way Paul puts it in the next chapter, Ephesians 2. God raised us up with Christ and made us sit with him in the heavenly places. That means we are already in heaven in Christ. One commentator said it this way. 
Through their union with the exalted Christ, Christians have already been made beneficiaries of every spiritual blessing. Alfred, a different scholar, said, Materially we are still in the body, but in the spirit we are in heaven, only waiting for the redemption of the body to be entirely and literally there in Christ. Years ago I interviewed an old woman, Christian woman, raised Jewish, but a Christian woman now, and she, was, she somehow came to Christ before she went into the Nazi concentration camp. When she was a young woman, she was in the concentration camp, and she told me her best Christmas on earth was in the, in the camp because she said, that Christmas I had nothing but Jesus. And that's the point here. We are in Christ. In other words, no matter what they do, us, do to us down here, we're already up there in Christ. Jesus said, do not lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, but, no, excuse me, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be. So in other words, if I checked your, if I checked your checkbook, <laughs> would there be evidence that your heart is in heaven? Verse 4. Just as God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Here's the next lesson. God chose us. Jesus said in John 15 to his disciples, Disciples, you did not choose me. I chose you. And when did God choose you? Before you were born? No, zillions of years before that. Look at this verse. Ephesians 1 verse 4. God chose you before the foundation of the world. That means before God made all the planets, he chose you to be a Christian. If you are watching this program and you believe in Jesus, it's only because before he made the world, he said, I'm going to make that person a Christian. I'm going to choose that person. So here's my point. People don't, don't like this, but here's my point. I don't believe in free will. And most Christians do. Um, but they say, well, you mean, Pastor, you mean God converts someone against their will? God converts everyone against their will. Think of the Apostle Paul. Did Paul the Apostle come to Christ on his own free will? No. God had to knock him off his horse, blind him for three days, and then Paul became a Christian. I think that's the way we're all saved. None of us would come to God on our own power because we like sin too much. It's only when God overrules our will that we are broken and come to him. It says in the book of Acts, Acts 16, the Lord opened Lydia's heart to receive what Paul said. It doesn't say Lydia did that. It says the Lord did that. And Martin Luther put it this way explaining the, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? I cannot by my own reason or strength come to my Lord Jesus Christ or believe in him, but the Holy Spirit does that. Now, somebody could say, but what about Joshua 24, where it says, choose this day whom you shall serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Don't you have to choose Christ? And the answer is, yes, you do. You have to choose Christ to be saved. You have to believe in him. You have to repent. I'm just saying, you can't do any of that on your own. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit that God gives to those who he has predestined. Ephesians 2, verse 5 puts it this way. Even when we were dead through our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him. In other words, a corpse can't do anything. We were a corpse. We were dead in our trespasses. The way we got saved is God is the one who, who brought us to faith and to salvation. And, and um, uh, do you know that even your faith is not something you do? Even that's a gift of God, which is why it says in Acts 13, the apostles are preaching and it says, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Uh, Spurgeon was a great preacher in the 1800s, and here's the way he put it. A needle will move toward a magnet once a magnet has moved near to it. It is ours to run to Jesus as if all the running were our own. But the secret truth is that the Lord runs toward us, and this is the very heart of salvation. Verse 4 teaches, God chooses us, not vice versa. Look at verse 4 again. He chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Here's the next lesson. 
Christians are holy. The word holy means set apart, separate from. And there are two ways Christians are holy. First is called imputed holiness. Follow this. Jesus lived 33 years of perfect obedience to God. When you put your faith in Christ, his 33 years of perfect obedience is imputed to your account. So when God sees you, he doesn't see a sinner. He sees 33 years of perfect imputed righteousness of Christ. That's one way we are holy. A second way is called imparted righteousness or imparted holiness. That not only does God impute me as holy because of Christ, he actually starts making me holy. He starts cleaning me up. Now I still sin till I die in thought, word, and deed, but there's a process where he's cleaning me up. Imparted holiness. Let's look at verse 5. This, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. The word destined there literally is he predestined. Here's the next lesson. Christians are predestined. Now people who don't like this will say, but I don't think predestination is fair. Well, okay, but the word's in the Bible. And some, when I hear a Christian say, well, I don't believe in predestination. Wait a minute. The word is in the Bible. <laughs> and, you know, um, let me clarify something. Some Christians think predestination just means foreknowledge, that God knows ahead of time whether I'll accept Christ or not. Well, the word the foreknowledge is in the Bible. God does know, foreknow everything. But this word is not only foreknowledge, foredestination. He not only knows the future, he causes the future. So... Does that mean that God pre-causes, predestined who will be saved? And the answer is yes. Now, I know this gets confusing. I'm confused by it. But, you know, I think this will help. Please follow this. The Bible teaches two different things. They're both true. How they're both true at the same time, only the Lord knows. But the Bible teaches two things. Number one, God does predestine everything. But the second truth is, you are accountable for your behavior on Judgment Day. Both of those are true. How are they true? I mean, if he predestines everything, how's he going to hold me accountable for something? I don't know, but it's kind of like this. Like two ropes are going up into heaven. Up above the clouds, they tie together. Below the clouds, you don't see how they tie together. Two things are true. God predestines all, and we are still accountable for our behavior. How are these both true? I don't know. We'll find out in heaven. Verse 5. He predestined us as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Here's the next lesson. Christians are predestined according to God's will. Follow this. Some people think, well, God just saw ahead of time whether I would accept Christ or not. And on that basis, he predestined me. That's not what it says. It, the reformers rejected that because that smells of work salvation, that there's something a little better in me than in my brother, and that's why God chose me. No, here it says, God predestined us according to his will. It's a will thing of God. It's not anything that I did. Verse 6. This was all to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved Christ. Here's the next lesson. God's purpose and predestination is that we would praise his grace. When you come to understand everything, your repentance, your faith, Christ's death, everything ultimately is a gift from God. You don't praise you for anything you did. You praise him because it's all his grace. I, I, have a, I knew a man by the name of Buddy Balo. He says to me, Tom, have I ever told you how I got saved? One day a friend dragged me to this crusade meeting. I didn't want to go. So I was leaning on the back wall. The preacher's up in the front. If you've never accepted Christ, come forward. Buddy Balo said, I felt something push me in the back. I turned around. There were just bricks. Second time, if you've never accepted Christ, come forward. He said, second time, boom. He said, third time. Third and final time, if you've never. He said, the third push was so strong, he stumbled walked up the aisle, and got saved that night. <laughs> I think that's the way God saves everybody. You and I would never come to God on our own power because we love sin too much. It's only when God, hallelujah, shoves and pushes his way into our lives that we get saved. 
Now, the next verse is very important because it's the gospel in a nutshell. Here we go, verse 7. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Let me quickly define each of those important words. Here's the gospel. First word is redemption. To be redeemed means to pay a price to set something free. We were slaves. Jesus came in, paid our redemption price to set us free from the devil. We are redeemed how? By Christ's blood. The word blood simply refers to Christ's sacrificial death. His death on the cross is his blood. That's what saves us. Third word, we are redeemed through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. The word forgiveness in the Greek New Testament means to let go, to send away. So it's kind of like God says, I'll let you go. I send away all your sins because Christ has now paid for them. And then the last word are, this is done by grace. The word grace means God's unearned favor. It's a gift. You can't earn it. That's the gospel. Verse 8. The grace of God, which he, God the Father, lavished on us. Here's the next lesson. God's forgiveness is lavish. Do you ever wonder if God forgives your sin? Then you need to let the sweetness of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8, just, just fall upon you. God's forgiveness and grace of you is lavish. I, uh, I had a person tell me that she used to go to a church filled with former drug addicts, pimps, and prostitutes. And she was talking about her church, and I thought, that's the kind of church I want to go to, where people know the forgiveness of God is lavish. Now and then, I have preached at Teen Challenge. And Teen Challenge, you go there to preach, and there's maybe 200 people there, people coming off of drugs and alcohol and all kinds of sinful lifestyles. You should hear those people sing. <laughs> I mean, it's just... These people know that God's forgiveness of their sins has been lavish. One, one preacher put it this way. Every day children invade the beach with their shovels and their uh, little pails, and they kind of make their sand castles and kind of destroy the beach. But then they, the waves come in, and it's as clean and pure as ever. And the next morning they come out and damage the beach again. Then the waves, and his point was, that's God's forgiveness. God lavishly forgives your sins. Well, pastor, what if I keep sinning? Well, as long as you keep repenting and truly coming to Christ, he keeps being lavish to you. Now we're going to get to a mystery that most people don't know about. Ephesians 1, verse 9. God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in Christ with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens, and things on the earth. And here's, the, here's a mystery that most people don't know about. In Christ, heaven and earth will be united. Once upon a time, heaven and earth was united. Adam and Eve, God in the garden, there was love, perfection, everything was great. Then Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, uh, destruction came into the world, death, and there was, a, there was a separation. At the end of time, when Christ comes back, heaven and earth will be united again. Look at verse 11. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Here's the result of predestination. You live for the praise of his glory. I think one way to tell if you're predestined is, do you care about the glory of God? I mean, when people say, oh my God, does it bug you? I mean, you know what I do? When I hear people say that, I stop and say a prayer for them. I'm praying for all kinds of people. I hear that all the time now. One reason God predestined you is that you would care for his glory. Well, the last verse we're going to look at here is going to explain the steps in salvation. How do you go from being predestined before the world is created all the way to save today? How does predestined work its way out step by step into your life? Quickly, here are the steps of salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him, Christ, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. The first step in being saved is you hear the gospel. Maybe grandma 
or maybe your Sunday school teacher, or maybe uh, some TV preacher. Somehow you hear the gospel. That's the first step in being saved. And then the second step, uh, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. Second step in salvation is you believe in Christ. Now, you know, you might say, well, I thought all I had to do to be saved was be predestined. That's true. But if you're predestined, you always end up believing in Christ. That's the way it works. Um, you know, it's, therefore, it troubles me when we have pastors now in the pulpit teaching there are all kinds of roads to God. You don't have to believe in Jesus. We had people come to the church that I serve because their Lutheran pastor said, basically, Jesus was wrong when he claimed to be the only way. No, the Bible teaches you have to believe in Christ to be saved. So steps are you hear about Christ, you believe in Christ. Third step in salvation is verse 13. Having been also sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise. Third step of salvation is you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Back in ancient Rome, the time period of the Bible, if Caesar put his seal on a letter, that means this is really from Caesar. God has put his seal on us, the Holy Spirit, saying, I really own you now. And verse 14 says this, The Holy Spirit has given us as a pledge of our inheritance, or a down payment of our inheritance, with the review to the redemption of God's own possession. So, so in other words, the, the next step in salvation, you hear it, you believe in Christ, you're sealed with the Spirit, and then the next thing, until you get possession, you wait. I mean, if you have a mortgage, you put down your down payment. That means you own the house, but not really until all the payments are made. The Holy Spirit is in us. He's the seal. We're really saved, but you've got to wait until the second coming or till your death, till it actually 100% takes place. Last step of salvation, verse 14, to the praise of his glory. So you hear the gospel, you believe the gospel, you're sealed with the Spirit, you wait, and then you praise him for his glory. In heaven, you will eternally praise his glory. When you're in heaven, you're going to say, thank you, God, that you did all my salvation. It's all from you. I praise you for that. There we go. That is one of the longest, deepest sentences in the Bible. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor's study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of Scripture and his insight to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. Pastor Brock, do most Christian churches teach free will? And I guess a second part to that question would be, is free will in the Bible? Uh, you've got choose this day whom you shall serve, and you've got will, you've got human will, people doing all kinds of evil things. So we're not denying that there's a will in the man or the woman. What I am denying is that you, on your own power, can come to Christ and believe in him. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, apart from me, disciples, you can do nothing. <laughs> and Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That is not your own doing. It's a gift of God. So it, it kind of, you've got to define your terms. I mean, the way Luther put it is that we have free will in lesser things. Like you can choose chocolate over vanilla ice cream. But when it comes to choosing God and coming to Christ, that's only when the Holy Spirit opens your eyes and brings you to the Lord. Well, what is the difference between God's foreknowledge and his foredestination? Yeah, the Bible teaches both. God has foreknowledge. He knows everything that there is. But some people think that's what predestination is. It isn't. Foreknowledge is he knows everything. Predestined means he destines things. He causes people. So, Jackie, why are you a Christian? Why am I a Christian? Is it because you're smarter than your neighbor next door? Or I'm holier than my, my neighbor next door? The reason I'm saved is before the foundation of the world, it says, Ephesians 1, he predestined us. That's pretty amazing it's to think amazing. about that God did that for us. Yeah. You said that God chooses people, but why doesn't God choose everybody? All right, and this is, this is the hard question. Why doesn't he choose to save everybody and force everybody to be saved? And the free will people would say because he does choose everybody, but they reject him. Well, okay, there's truth that people reject Christ. That's all over the, all over the world. Um, but, if you, Jackie, if you read Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, that's where the Apostle Paul most deeply deals with predestination. And Paul says, God hardens whom he wills, and he has mercy whom he wills. 
You will say to me, why does God find fault for who can resist his will? Paul's answer is don't back, talk back to God. <laughs> so I don't know the answer to some of this stuff. I okay. just don't know. Does God forgive my sins if I keep sinning over and over? I think if there's true repentance and faith, yes. I, I think, for instance, Jackie, I, I just had this discussion. If a, if a wom woman, young woman sleeps with her boyfriend and she's sorry and she repents, there's forgiveness. If she's living with the boyfriend, that's a whole different issue. And 1 Corinthians 6 says fornicators don't go to heaven. So it's a matter of are you fighting your sin even though you're stumbling? Are you claiming forgiveness, getting back up? Or are you living in impenitent sin? That's where there's the person's soul is in trouble. All right, Pastor Tom, you said that one day heaven and earth will be reunited. Is nature part of the fall of mm -hmm. mankind? You know, if you read Romans chapter 8, when Adam and Eve fell, nature fell with them. I mean, when you look at nature, Jackie, with lions ripping apart zebras, it, it, nature's, nature's brutal. And, and if you read Romans 8, uh, the whole creation fell when Adam and Eve fell. So just read that on your own. But this is what Jesus will undo and restore when he returns. Does a person have to hear the gospel to be saved? Well, what I just took people through, Ephesians 1, the steps of salvation, the first step is you hear the gospel. And so can people who have never heard about Christ in deep, dark, wherever, be saved? Um, I think the only safe way is to give him, get him Christ. And I don't, uh, it, it's, it's uh, he who believes in the Lord Jesus will be saved is what Acts 16 says. But didn't God put those people there? Yes, and he does did. does he choose and to you know, have some them? Some Christians, and I'm not, I don't want to go there, but some Christians think that people that never hear the gospel, God somehow gives them a chance somehow to accept Christ or not. I don't see that anywhere, but that's their theory. So. Well, we want to thank you for being with us this week. We pray that God would be with you, granting you his richest blessings until we're together again next time. God bless. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always.